Speaking of censorship, I want to get your take on something else. I think these last two weeks have been a complete sea change in venture capital. And let me give you the setup. It's all of a sudden seemed like um, there's been a decision that's been made where the ecosystem of companies will basically use their own platforms and their own mediums to completely control the narrative and the dissemination of information about them, that the media in the effort of company building um, may have taken a big step back. Um, you know, I think uh, the whole sort of like thing on Clubhouse was really interesting. I think uh, this guy who just joined Andreessen Horowitz um, who actually hosts a show on Clubhouse is really interesting. Um, I think there's some like um, really interesting emerging managers who just have these incredibly different ways of. Sri going Ram to market. is his name. Um, Sri he's Ram, been hosting right. Good Times at 11, p 10 or 11 p.m. every yeah. night on Clubhouse. Mark Andreessen comes to it every night. And of course, Elon came, interviewed Vlad. And then last night, Zuckerberg showed up. Uh, in order to get the blueprints for Clubhouse to then put it into <laughs> Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> but what do you guys, what do you guys think of sort of like this entire sector of the economy basically trying to, I guess, organize an end around it, it's, I don't know uh, traditional it's just, media? It no, doesn't no, no. seem like it's just venture, right? I mean, look at, look at Trump. You know, he avoided having the traditional press conference as the, the, the channel for dissemination of his point of view and communication of his, uh, objectives. And he went on Twitter every day and he just tweeted. Um, and I think, you know, anyone who's been part of a business or an operation that's had to deal with, you know, media gathering facts that uh, that you don't consider to be true and you can't really counter their point and then they publish and it's static and it's out there, um, you're frustrated. And in, the, in the, the world that we have today, which is many alternatives for going direct to our customer and going direct to our audience through social media and having control over that message, uh, it's appealing to make the switch away from traditional PR and going to social. I mean, Chamath, you don't put out press releases. You go on Twitter and you make a, a statement about what your intentions are and you publish I, your one pagers. And I feel like everyone's trying to do this. And there's all this like trend at big companies now too, which is how do you develop a quote unquote social media presence? You can speak directly to your audience and your customers without having to go through the press. I find it very so. hard um, to get the point across um, by going through traditional media. Right. It's not that it's not that it can't be done, but I find it harder and harder. And the reason is because they're in such a ferocious competition with social media. And so they have to be just as click oriented and newsworthy totally. Totally. Um, as the next best tweet that's that's trending at that time. So it's it's that an almost impossible right. task. Well, Naval Naval had a great line about this, which I think he tweeted a long time ago, which is that the internet commoditized the reporting of facts. And so at that point, the the traditional media went wholesale into Opinion. opinions into opinions and so now they all have an agenda of some totally. kind and especially the tech press their agenda basically is hatred of tech i mean they right. hate the people they're reporting on i mean jake how you know this right i mean yeah i mean I, having been a journalist in this I, it's really interesting to hear your opinions and if you look at trust among uh republicans all-time low uh in the press and then just all Americans don't trust the press right now. They think there's hidden agendas and it really is a confluence of events. What happened was the internet caused um, the revenue streams of the press to get just violently compressed or eliminated. So, you know, you had Craigslist take the classified business, Google and Facebook took the ad business in subscriptions, Netflix, Spotify, et cetera. So you have all that revenue is gone. And what that meant was they, uh, didn't have the resources to do fact checking. And then the publishing schedule because of blogging, which I was involved in, required that people file two, three, four times a day just to keep up. And so when you're filing even just twice a day, there is no time to get quotes from the subjects. So we have all as people who are subjects had quotes uh, attributed to us that we're like, where did you pull that quote from? And like, oh, three years ago, you said this or whatever. And that you don't even know you're going to be in the story. Like the hit piece they did on you, Chamath, some sports writer in SF gate did some hit piece on Chamath. Did they ever call you? Did they ever say, would you like to respond no. to this? That's how it used to work. That's what, you, that's what you learn when you get a degree in journalism, right? You call the subject, you interview. Of course. And it used to be check. you filed once every two weeks, or maybe if you were in a weekly news, a news, like a news week or a business week, you filed once a week. Magazines, you filed once uh, or twice per episode, per issue, or maybe once every other issue or feature writer. 
Now they have to they have to publish so much. By the way, Jason, you they said don't something. Don't do any fact checking. You said something really, really important. It's the craziest thing where these guys will not even call you and say, "Here's what we're running," or "Here's what we're going to say." Do you want to work through this with us? Do you want to tell us, are there any inaccuracies? We're yeah. really seeking the truth. Nobody's really seeking the truth. They're seeking and, clicks. Yes. And, and so, so here's what happens. Yeah. The, your salary is now determined by your number of followers on Twitter, as is your book deal. And your sub stack then becomes your negotiating position versus your existing publication. So someone like Kara Swishers, who is not full time at the New York Times, probably makes a half million or a million dollars a year doing her podcast with them in the editorial page, I, I would say somewhere between 500k and a million. All the other writers there are looking at other people who've gotten significant followings and saying, I have to get a big following. How do you get a big following? Well, Sachs figured that out. He he wasn't didn't have a huge following on Twitter in the last couple of months, but since we did the podcast, Sachs started having an opinion and picking a side and really owning his opinion. And what and, happened? And, but in fairness, Massive and also engagement. being super and super intelligent and thoughtful about it, of course. But anybody picking a side gets rewarded, and if you go down the middle, you don't get rewarded because people go that makes but, sense. But, but then I You're think not that people outraged. then people should just be using facts as a jumping off point as opposed to like weaving it into the narrative so that other folks get confused. Meaning, you know, it used to be the case that a newspaper has an opinion page. Well, no, now the whole newspaper is opinions. Correct. Because yes. the facts you can just get from the AP, right? right? Like there's there's no point calling the New York Times to figure out what the hell is really going what on in the world. They should be doing is deep analysis. Yeah, like that New York Times article that you brought up a couple of weeks ago, Chamat, that we talked about on the pod was uh, about the, the the trust fund kids who are giving away all their money. You know, it wasn't an analysis of how many people with this amount of wealth are giving away their money. It was anecdotes to make the case that this is the storyline yeah. that they kind of wanted to, to progress. And, you know, that is, I think, the where you're able to kind of stay within the bounds of traditional journalism but still, you know, get a narrative across that is a bit sensational and, and it is a bit kind of, you know, inspiring. And Freeberg, all you need to do, having been on the inside of these discussions, is when you have one person, it's a profile, as an example. When you have two, um, it's still a kind of a profile with an example. But once you get to three, you got a trend piece. And so yeah, what and, your editor say to you is, if you can get me a third person who's a trust fund kid, now we got a trend piece and we're in the clear. So let's do that and do the anecdotes instead of actual research, which then takes time and resources. And if you look, what Andreessen Horowitz has specifically done with Clubhouse is, and it's really freaked out some New York Times reporters, I won't say which ones, because every time I mention this one reporter, she pulls the female reporter card. And she pulled it last night where she said, I'm a who, female oh, reporter. Taylor, I've been Taylor Lawrence. By Mark Andreessen. Ta yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say who it is because she Taylor, gets really Taylor, upset. No, no, it, it's Taylor Lawrence, but she, I mean, she, yeah, she tweeted it. So I don't think yeah, she's so she, hiding I, from I, it. She does it to <laughs> me. And I, I didn't want to put it in the public. Name, <laughs> now bringing up her name, she will, I guarantee you, tweet. Can, well, can I say something I about. I'm being harassed by Jason Calacanis because I'm a woman. She's saying that Mark Andreessen and Andreessen Horowitz blocked her from their clubhouse room. When you're blocked from a clubhouse room, you don't get access. So she said, I'm gonna make my own shadow account. She did make a, a puppet account. Now she's listening in. And she got upset at me because I told people in a room, hey, there's a New York Times report in the room. Just be careful because this could wind up in print. She called that harassment and gender-based well, harassment. And, and, and the, the, the thing they're complaining about now is that all of us are trying to go around them and just tell our stories directly. And so they're right. all enraged. They're saying, how dare Mark Andreessen or, you know, A16Z, you know, not talk to us. It's like, well, wh why should they? I mean, you know, my experience with the press has been that about 75% of the time when they ask me for comment on something, it ends up being a hit piece. Um, Maybe not on me, but on some something I care about, and they 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 twist what you say or take one little quote out of context to support the article, and you end up giving credence to an article that you completely disagree with, and so and so all of us have to stop taking those calls. I mean, we just know we just know there's such an agenda behind most of these um, calls that we just like don't take them anymore. Yeah, that's that's why we're going direct. Yeah, I'll say one thing about Taylor Lawrence. I I've learned a lot because I feel like you know being forty four, I'm kind of out of the no. Yes, and I've learned a lot because she's she has her finger she on the understands pulse. Taylor, TikTok. She, I mean, it's really it's been really fun reading her uh, reading her stuff. The other thing I'll say is on the Andreessen thing. I think what they have finally stumbled into, like I remember when you know Andreessen started about a year before I started Social Capital, and I remember the whole push was you know, multi-services, right? And they were going to be recruiting and sales and this and that. 
you know, I suspect that all of that was kind of like pretty meager ROI and not that it just burned a ton of fees. But I think this thing that they're doing is really smart because if they effectively build their own distribution arm through newsletters, Substack, podcasts, you know, clubhouse shows, whatever, that's a force to be reckoned with. Because then if you're a venture investor, you either have to be like them with their own version, in which case the, the brand of and Andreessen really matters, or you're on this path of where the trend of venture is already going, which is solo GPs and individual people are the brands. Mm. And there's going to be very little space in the middle. So for example, like, I do think that like, you know, the all in podcast helps, for example, David in craft, um, or Jason, you in launch, but you guys oh, the also syndicate is going crazy. But and you guys also stand alone as individuals. Um, but you know, if you're a traditional firm, you know, pick your organization, which neither has brands nor has distribution. W what are you doing? Well, you're probably forced to just pay the highest price. And so those returns for those folks in the middle get really bad, I think, over time. And uh, you at some point have to decide, are you an individual person? Right. And yes. there's like some amazing up and coming GPs. We know them, Locky Groom, go folks like that. Yep. Or are you, are you Andreessen Horowitz yep. with this massive distribution? Well, I mean, and now we have to just, I think, face the reality that we are in competition. And I think that's what is making the press even more. And that's what makes the situation even more complicated. I'm not saying the press is targeting people they consider competitive, but the press is not getting Vlad, Elon, or Zuck for interviews. But because Mark Andreessen has, you know, Clubhouse now, they put themselves on the suggested follower list. Just like Twitter put Ohm, Kara Swisher, and some other journalists on the suggested follower list for Twitter. What that was, was it was payment, basically, like a million followers. Now Andreessen has a million followers. Balaji, all these folks from Andreessen, I believe, have like a million followers. So the press is complaining about that as well, because they can then dominate them in terms of getting subjects. So they've lost the subjects. None of us get on the phone with the press with very few exceptions. And where is Sway or Vox or Ezra Klein when compared to our podcast, right? Like we're right up there with them, if not ahead of them. I mean, we're the number one tech podcast. So it's, it's pretty crazy when you think about how much their world has changed. And now they're directly in competition with Andreessen Horowitz, all in podcast you know, totally. pick the firm doing a venture thing. And that's going right. to make this even more contentious. I predict. Yes, I, I, I totally ag I agree with that. But I also, I, I do think fundamentally that all of us wouldn't have felt the same need to go around them if right. we didn't feel that there was such a strong agenda. Just to bring what, have you guys heard of gel man amnesia effect? Michael no, Crichton. Us. Okay. So Michael Crichton, you know, who wrote Jurassic Amazing. Park and it, like a true polymath and genius, right? Yeah. Airframe, um, very good, by the way. I, I mean, know. so many brilliant things. He uh, was even a, a Hollywood director, true multi-talented guy. Anyway, he described the, the gel man amnesia effect as follows. He says, you open the newspaper to an article on some subject you know well. So in this case, it was a physics paper by on gel man. Okay. Um, he oh, says, I do know this. Yeah. Yeah. This great. He says, he says, you read the article and see the journalist has absolutely no understanding of either the facts or the issues. Often the article is so wrong, it actually presents the story backwards, reversing cause and effect. I call these the wet streets cause rain stories. The paper is full of them. Okay. In any case, you read with exasperation or amusement the multiple errors in a story. But then you turn the page to some other section, to national, international affairs, and you read the rest of the paper as if it was somehow more accurate. Totally. Um, you turn the page and forget what you know, which is that the journalist just gets so much wrong. And, and I think, you know, and, and all of us kind of suffer from gel man amnesia sometimes because we still, I think, take, when we read something in the paper, we take it at face value. And I think, but we, we all know that when it comes to tech reporting or whatever, there's so much misinformation that get, gets put out by these official channels. And I think at the end of the day, what's happening now with these end run around the traditional media, it's all a response to gel man amnesia. I think it's a problem of complexity. Um, you know, I, I remember years ago, I would, when I was younger, I would read the paper or read um, magazines about uh, science and um, engineering. And I was, you know, really interested in these topics. And it was only years later when I actually realized how wrong so many of those articles were as I started to read the original scientific research papers 
but it takes a skill set and it takes a significant amount more time to really go into depth into those papers and to actually read them. The same is true, as you point out, with like, you know, geopolitical issues, like the complexity of what goes on. Yeah. Um, Here, here's uh, what know, I learned nations. when I was a journalist. We would have about 10 to 20% of the information about what occurred when we've pu published our first story. And then maybe every subsequent follow up, we get another 10%, which means if we were really hooked into a story and we did five versions of that story, we might get to 40%, 50% understanding. Whereas when the four of us are doing a deal and then you see this impact, you, you know the press is getting it completely wrong. And that was fine. If you felt the press was fair, right? But and Jason, that's I think what's it, happening I, is now there. It, it, there's a distinct feeling with subjects that they're being treated unfairly. And what I do when somebody connects to me and they say, "Hey, can you comment on Robin or whatever?" I said, "I can't," but I do have a great story for you about a world positive startup. And I kept doing this with Teddy, who kept asking me to give information on friends of mine. You know, the guy from uh, Rico or whatever who covers like philanthropy. And every time they contact me, I say, yeah, you know, I can't comment on that, but you can talk to the founder, but I have three world positive stories. Are you interested in any of them? And I just do that kind of to troll them. And they've never in five years taken me up on profiling a world positive. So if the press wants to turn this around, a very simple solution is one for you, one of your hate stories. So if you for every time you want to take down a company, maybe write about one company that's doing something good. There's some company doing something in carbon sequestering right now yeah. that is super valid and world positive. Write about it. And the only time they write about Tesla is when Elon trips or, you know, something, uh, somebody dies in a car or they write about Uber because of some tragedy. Sorry, I just want to say, like, Jason, like, just going back a second, like, th your point is one about bias, which is, you know, creating sensationalism, sell stories. It's what consumers want to consume sure. um, at the end of the day. So there's certainly, you know, um, a, a market driven model there. The, the point I was trying to make earlier is there's also a separate problem around complexity, which is complex issues take time and take depth mm -hmm. to truly understand. And so to really understand what's going on in the Middle East or what's going on inside of a company like Facebook requires more than a five paragraph journal article. It requires some hours of conversation and dialogue. And I think, by the way, the craving for that depth, which delivers truth and understanding is what, you know, podcasts can provide and Clubhouse is providing long form content hmm. that allows you to go into 100. the nuance and into the texture and into the depth of what's going on in the world, as opposed to having the five paragraph littered with ads, BuzzFeed article that says something sensational, but it simplifies something to the point that it's often wrong or completely misses the real depth of what's going on. And, you know, it's like, and, and I think that, I, I think they're both, they're both, they're both kind of playing into each other. Yeah. And then I want to give a prediction. The, 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 they're both, what you're describing are both issues. And I think they're related in the following sense that if you were to go to like any of these reporters, like the people that J. Cal mentioned a couple of names, okay. If you were to filter their bylines, and see all of their, not, not one story, but look at like all of the headlines for all their stories over, say, the past year. You will definitely see a trend. They will of all, course. they will all have, you know, like negative. For, for certain reporters, it'll be 100% negative about tech, 0% yeah, positive. I mean, Aaron Griffin, I think, is the reporter who's one of the top tech reporters at the New York Times. It's just like Coinbase, Coinbase, away. Yeah, exactly. So when's the last time they wrote a positive story? So there is this huge agenda there. And um, and I think it prevents people from getting into the complexity because it's a lot easier to write. You Here's know, the that, prediction. That, 